And to, <laughs> and only preach in the evenings, you see. So it's morning, isn't it? It's morning. It's, morning. it's, morning. it's almost evening, yeah. yeah. This morning, okay. I want to read from Isaiah chapter 12. <coughs> only six verses in it, which doesn't mean you're getting a short service. No. Isaiah chapter 12. And in that day thou shalt say, O Lord, I will praise thee, though thou wast angry with me, thy anger is turned away, and thou comfortest me. Look at verse 2. Behold, God is my salvation. I will trust and not be afraid. For the Lord Jehovah is my strength and my song. He also has become my salvation. You could whisper hallelujah for that one, couldn't you? <laughs> Verse 3, love this one. Therefore, with joy shall you draw water out of the wells of salvation. And in that day shall you say, praise the Lord, call upon his name, declare his doings among the people, make mention that his name is exalted. Sing on to the Lord, for he has done excellent things. There is no one in all the earth. Cry out and shout, inhabitants of Zion, for great is the Holy One of Israel in the midst of thee. Amen? Amen. If you read Isaiah chapter 12, you probably think it's like reading a psalm, isn't it? Because... Uh, you think this chapter should be in the Psalms, wouldn't you? You would think that that's what it's kind of like. And uh, in many ways, it's a change because if you read Isaiah chapter 12, thank God we're not preaching tonight, or Isaiah chapter 13, uh, it's, it's a prophecy against Babylon. Babylon is doomed. Woe to Babylon. Chapter 14 is a prophecy against Assyria. Chapter 15 and 16 is woe to Moab and the inhabitants of Moab. It's all woe. And if you ever read the, the first, you know, 39 books of Isaiah, chapters, it's all woe and, and all these prophecies. And yet here in verse 12, we get this like a little psalm, as it were. It's actually a song. So Isaiah chapter 12 is actually the prophet Isaiah singing a song in the midst of all these woes that he's doing. Now thank God this morning I'm not going to sing chapter 12 because if I did, this would all go out the door. <laughs> and so would I, by the way. But it's actually a song of praise to God in the midst of all the destruction that's going to happen to the nations around Israel. But it's verse 3 that I really am drawn to. Because in verse 3 it says, Therefore with joy will you draw water from the wells of salvation. When you become a born again Christian, the very day that you gave your life to Jesus, there was a well of salvation opened up on the inside of you. Did you ever think of that? But the moment that you gave your life to Jesus and you became a Christian, the Holy Spirit comes and lives on the inside of you. That means that there is a deep well of salvation on the inside of your body, as it were. And that means that when the enemy, the devil, attacks you, which he will, with lies, destroys your family, destroys your church, destroys your job, or your health, your health. The one thing you have to know, all you have to do, is with joy, lower your bucket into the wells of salvation that's on the inside of you with joy and draw from the wells of salvation that's inside of you. And the good news this morning is this, that that well will never run dry. 
That well is always going to be overflowing in your life. There is a deep well of salvation on the inside of you today. The sad thing is that most Christians can go through their whole life not being aware of the wells of salvation that's on the inside of them. And when something goes wrong in your life, you can go, help, 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 I'm in trouble again. And you can run to a pastor and you can run here and you can run there. But what does the Bible say? With joy, draw from the <coughs> wells of salvation that are where? Well on the inside of you. So no matter what happens, that well or wells of salvation is always there. Now, when the Bible says that we are to draw with joy from the wells of salvation, most people in this room know what a well is. I don't have to explain in a half an hour what a well is, okay? You have a big hole in the ground and you have a shaft come down into it and you have a this kind of a bucket up here which you, you have a lever and a shaft and you load the bucket down, you often see it on the television, you don't really get them in this country because the water just is on the top of the ground. <laughs> you don't have to draw the water, it's already outside the dome and it's raining. But in hot countries, they have to dig a hole way down under the ground, and they put a little wall around to stop children from falling into it or dogs, and then they have this little kind of a, a roof over it to stop leaves or something falling into it and then you pull a pin and the bucket goes down into the well and you go like this and you bring up the bucket of fresh water out of the well. I don't have to explain that to you because that's what a well is. But what is salvation? Because we are to draw from the wells of salvation. So what does the word salvation actually mean? The best person in the Bible, or maybe I should say, the second best person in the Bible to explain salvation is Isaiah. The best person is obviously Jesus, because he is salvation. The word Isaiah, or Isaiah, means salvation comes from the Lord. That's what his name means. Of course, in Hebrew, you would say, yes, Yahweh. I didn't say that this morning. If I said to you this morning, I'm preaching from Yes, Yahweh, you'd say, Peter's got a new Bible up there. <laughs> <laughs> but his Hebrew name is Yes, Yahweh, which means God saves, or salvation comes from the Lord. So the word salvation comes from the Greek word suzo. Okay? And what that means is that you are saved from the coming judgment. Okay, someday in the future, this world is going to be judged. Now, why would God judge this world? Well, he has to, because God is holy. And because God is holy, he cannot tolerate sin. When there is sin, there is judgment, and there is death, and death leads to hell. God has to judge this world. Back in the book of Genesis, when there was sin in the world and God is holy, what did God do? God said to Noah, I want you to build an ark and Noah and his family, eight of them went into the ark and when the ark was closed, when the door was closed and that boat was floating around in the sea, God had judged the world. Everybody died in the flood. But <laughs> Noah and his wife and family, they were Suzo. They were saved from God's judgment. Now, God is going to judge the world again. Not by a flood. He can't do that because he gave us the promise of a <coughs> rainbow. But God is going to judge the world again. This time, he's going to judge by fire. Now, if you are born again and you've accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Saviour, you are Suzo, you are saved from that coming judgment. Because <coughs> salvation is found in no other name but the name of Jesus. So that means you are saved from that coming judgment. 
Let me give you an example of this. In Romania, there's a town called Shigeswaras. And that town was built about a thousand years ago. And the people in the town of Shigeswaras built the town with wood. Because all over Romania, the Carpathian Mountains, there's lots of trees, they cut down the trees, and they built wooden houses. So the town of Shigeswaras was a town uh, made of wooden houses. But in 1676, there was a fire in Shigeswaras, and all the houses were burned. And of course, the people ran out of their houses and ran out into the woods. When the fire was over, the people in Shigeswaras rebuilt their houses again. But this time, they built them with stone. I think that was a good idea. They had stone houses. <coughs> If you go to Shigeswaras today, it's actually a tourist attraction because it's an old town. There is one house in Shigeswaras, in the centre of the town, one house that actually survived the fire of 1676. Now how could one wooden house in the centre of the village survive a fire when all the other houses were destroyed? And the answer is, when you actually go into this house today, in the kitchen, there is a well. And when the fire happened, the people in this house ran into their house, they started to get buckets of water from the well and squash it all around the house, outside of the house, to keep the fire away, and the fire never came to this house. So this house actually survived the fire. Now that is a perfect example of salvation. All the other wooden houses completely destroyed, but one wooden house in the centre of the town because there was a well in the centre of that house. They were able to draw water and quench the fire and that house survived the fire. So salvation means you are saved from the coming judgment of God, which I believe could be coming quicker than we can imagine. So that's why you need to be born again. You need to be sure that you're saved from that coming judgment of fire. But salvation is not just pie in the sky when I die, but it's cake on the plate <coughs> when you wait. You can experience salvation today. You see, some people have this idea, well, when I die, I'm saved, I'm going to heaven, that's good. But you can enjoy salvation today. Because Paul says in 1 Thessalonians, I pray that my whole spirit, soul and body be preserved before the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. So how does salvation work? Or Suzo, the minute you become a born again Christian, your spirit is saved. You're going to heaven. But we still have problems in our mind, don't we? We still have bad thoughts, we still have rows, we still slap the dog, we still slam the door, and do other things. So that is because your soul, which is the innermost part of you, it needs to be sanctified. That's an ongoing process as you allow the Holy Spirit to take over your life and surrender your life to Jesus. And of course, your physical body needs healing. And many a time, and the Bible says, if there's anyone sick in the church, that the elders would lay hands on the sick and they'll be healed. That is part of salvation. So there's two sides to salvation. Number one, you're saved from the coming judgment that's going to fall on this world. But number two, you can experience salvation today as you <coughs> surrender your life to Jesus and allow your soul to be cleansed. That's called sanctification. And you can experience healing in your physical body. So salvation is body, soul and spirit. Now in verse 2 of chapter 12, Isaiah says, Behold, God is my salvation. In other words, God is my Suzo. He has saved me from the common judgment and he is helping me today with my ongoing life and my physical ailments. Now that word behold is also translated the word surely. And in some translations it says the word surely. 
And there's a very beautiful verse in Isaiah chapter 53 which says this, and you all know it. Isaiah 53 says, Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we did not smitten him, yet he did not esteem him stricken, smitten our God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. So we can have spiritual and our soul and body can be healed. And that's why Isaiah chapter 12 says, Behold, God is my salvation. And then he goes on to say in verse 3, Therefore, with joy shall you draw from the wells of salvation. So you have to experience verse 2. God has to be your, your salvation. When God becomes your salvation, then you can draw in verse 3 from the wells of salvation. Now speaking on the wells of salvation, the king that lived in Israel at the time of Isaiah was a man called Hezekiah. Now of all the kings of Israel, Hezekiah was one of the better kings. He made a few mistakes, but he was one of the better kings. Now at the time of Hezekiah's reign, the Assyrians had taken away the northern part of Israel. It was gone. And the Assyrians were going to come down to destroy Jerusalem. And Hezekiah was aware that someday soon the Assyrians are going to come to Jerusalem and destroy our city. So what did Hezekiah do? Hezekiah got two groups of people to dig a tunnel. Inside the city of Jerusalem, one group of people dug a tunnel out this way, and another group of people went out to the Goshan Spring, which is outside the city, and they dug a tunnel this side, underground, and the two of them met in the middle. And if you go to Israel today, you can actually walk underneath Jerusalem in Hezekiah's tunnel. And you'll see the chisel marks where they were chiseling this way. And eventually you'll see the chisel marks where they went this way. And that's where they met in the middle. Now if you all remember the Channel Tunnel where the French and the, and the British had two tunnel borers and they met in the middle. <coughs> but they were using GPS. There was no GPS back in this day. And yet they, ex they met exactly in the middle. Now what happened was this. Hezekiah was aware that when the Assyrians come to Jerusalem, there's going to be a siege. Hezekiah got all the food into the city of Jerusalem to store it up. But it's very hard to store water, fresh water, because you need fresh running water. You can't store it in big containers. So what did he do? He had this tunnel that went right under the city, out to the Gushan Spring. Okay, so when the siege came and the Assyrians surrounded the city of Jerusalem, they waited. They knew that the Hezekiah had lots of food, but the people in the city are going to run out of water. All we need to do is to stay outside the city and wait till they're thirsty. They've got the food, but they don't have any water. But what the Assyrians were not aware of is that underneath the enemy, right outside the city, there was fresh water flowing into the city all the time. What was Hezekiah doing? He was drawing from the wells of salvation that God, Jehovah, who was my salvation, had provided. And the Assyrians waited and waited and thought, are they ever going to give up? And one day, one angel flew over the city of Jerusalem and killed 185,000 Assyrian soldiers. And they went back to Assyria, and the city of Jerusalem was saved. What lessons could we learn from that? Let me tell you something. There are times in your life, and my life, where you feel that you are completely surrounded by the enemy. 
this is going wrong and that's going wrong and everything seems to be a mess. And there's times where you feel your whole life is surrounded by problems. What do you do? I'll tell you what you do. With joy, you draw from the wells of salvation that are well, that are in the inside of you. That's what you do. Do you know joy and salvation go together? You can't have one without the other. That's why King David said when he repented, he says, restore unto me the joy of my salvation. Are you saved this morning? Amen? Have you got joy in your hearts? Because I'm preaching. <laughs> or have you joy in your hearts? Because you know that no matter what happens in your life, Jesus is in control. We were praying this morning that he's King of Kings and Lord of Lords. He's in control of every aspect of your life. And no matter how the enemy has surrounded you, you just focus on the Lord and draw with joy from the wells of salvation that's inside of you. By the way, one of the fruit of the Spirit is what? Love, joy and peace. And you'll only have love, joy and peace when you learn to draw from the wells that's within you. If you have your Bibles, I want you to turn to Genesis chapter 21. This is another story about wells. We're looking at <coughs> wells this morning. Lots of different wells. Now, there's one man in the Bible who's very big into wells. And we're going to read Genesis chapter 21, verses 22 to 23. And this is a story about Abraham. Now, Abraham is called the father of faith. I'm sure you've heard that before. But I would like to call Abraham the father of wells. Because everywhere that Abraham went, he was always digging wells. And if you read Genesis chapter 21, reading from verse 22, here is Abraham. And what's Abraham doing? He's digging wells. Let me read you the story. And it came to pass at that time that Abinamech and Pico, the chief captain of his host, speak unto Abraham, saying, God is with thee in all that thou doest. Now therefore swear unto me here by God that thou wilt not deal falsely with me, nor with my son, nor with my son's son, but according to the, ne to the kindness that I have done unto thee, thou shalt do unto me and to the land wherein I so journeyed. And Abraham said, I will swear. And Abram reproved Abinamech because of a well of water which Abinamech's servants had violently taken over. Verse 26. <clears throat> and Abinamech said, I would not who had done this thing, neither didst thou tell me, neither ye heard I of it but to today. Verse 27. And Abraham, listen to this, took sheep, oxen, and gave them to Abinamech, and both of them made a covenant. Verse 28, and Abraham sent seven young lambs of the flock by themselves. And Abinamech said unto Abram, what means thou seven young lambs? Why hast thou done this? Verse 30, and he said, for these seven young lambs shalt thou take of my hand, that there may be a witness unto me that I have did this well. Wherefore he called the place Beersheba, because there they swore both of them. Thus they made a covenant at Beersheba, and then Abinamech rose up, and Pico, the chief captain of his host, and they returned unto the land of the Philistines. <coughs> and Abinamech planted a grove of Beersheba, and called there on the name of the Lord, the everlasting God. And Abram so journeyed into the Philistines, land many days. Now what's actually happening in this story? Let me explain this story very, very quickly. What we have here is we have Abraham. Now everywhere Abraham goes, he has to dig wells because Abraham has cattle, he has sheep, he has goats, and he has camels. Okay? And those animals need a lot of water, particularly a camel. 
I mean, camels in those days is like somebody today driving a big SUV. An SUV is nice, it's comfortable, you're king of the road, people have to push over because you're, you're controlling everything, right? The only problem with SUVs is they're very thirsty, aren't they? They take a lot of juice. So they might be big and comfortable, but they are thirsty. Now, in those days, if you had a camel, that's a very comfortable way to travel compared to a horse or a donkey or something, but they are thirsty, particularly if there's two homes. That's a lot of water. So you need a lot of water. So everywhere Abraham goes, he is digging wells. But here's the problem. Abimelech comes along at night time and he covers the well over. The next day Abraham has to go and dig another well and then the Philistines and Abimelech come along and they cover the wells over. So what happens is this. Abraham says to Abimelech, we need to form a treaty because I can't be going around opening up wells and you coming along and covering them over. Now let me say something here. When you become a born again Christian, there is a deep well of salvation opened up on the inside of you. <clears throat> Amen? But let me tell you something. The devil wants to cover over your well. Because what the devil wants to do when you get saved, he wants you to go back to your old life. And the only way the devil can get you go back to your old life is to let you get empty and thirsty and you go back to what you used to do. So it's the very, very same thing. And that's what's happening in this particular story. Now what happens is this. Abimelech uh, he's a Philistine. And over here we have Abraham is a Jew. Now the funny thing is that Abimelech and Abraham, they both more or less have the same name. Think about it. What does the word Abilamech mean? The word Abilamech means my father is a king. The word, you know what the word Abba means? Yeah? The word Malkek is the Hebrew word for king. You've heard of Malkizadek, which means king of righteous. So here's a man called Abilamech, which means my father is a king. Now over here we have a man called Abraham. What does the word Abraham mean? It means father of nations. So here we have two people with more or less the same name. My father's a king, and I'm the father of multitude, or father of nations. Now, what does Abraham do? Abraham goes to Abimelech, and he says to him, I want to form a peace treaty with you. And that peace treaty is going to take place at a place called Beersheba. Now, the word Beersheba means the well of old. The Hebrew word for well is B-E-E-R, which is beer, okay? So ladies, mm -hmm. if your husband says to you, I'm going out for a few beers, don't worry, just go to the well for water, okay? Mm -hmm. Because the word beer, the word bear means well, so it's the well of old. Now notice that Abraham goes to Abimelech and he gives him sheep, he gives him oxen, and he gives them seven lambs. What does seven stand for in the Bible? Perfection. Perfection. And what does a lamb stand for? Jesus, the Lamb of God. Behold the Lamb of God. So he gives them, <coughs> you can read this in verse 28. And Abraham sent seven young lambs of the flock by themselves. So Abraham is given all this to Abimelech, and at Beersheba, Beersheba, Abraham and Abimelech enter into a covenant with seven lambs. Perfect covenant. Now, what happens after this? After this, Abraham and Abimelech go their own journeys. But guess what happens? If you read the rest of the story in the next chapter, Abimelech breaks the covenant. 
and very shortly he's going along and he's covering up the wells again. <laughs> it doesn't work. It doesn't work. But let's fast forward 2,000 years from Abraham and Abimelech to Jesus is 2,000 years. Now here's the interesting story. Here we have Jesus. And over here we have another man called Barabbas. You know the story of Jesus and Barabbas. Now the funny thing is that Jesus and Barabbas have more or less got the same names. What does the word Barabbas mean? The word Barabbas means, it comes from Bar, which is son, and the word Abba, which is father. So the word Barabbas means son of the father. And over here we've got a man called Jesus, who's the son of God. So here we have two people with more or less the same name. So these two people are put before the crowd. And the crowd have to decide which of these two people will we send to the cross? Barabbas, son of the father, or should we send Jesus, who's the son of the father, son of God, same thing. And the crowd shouted, Jesus. So Jesus was put on the cross and he was crucified. When Jesus was crucified on the cross and he died, a Roman soldier put a spear into the side of Jesus. And what came out? Blood and water. What happened at that moment was that the wells of salvation were opened up. But this time, the devil has been defeated and is not able to close that well. So the wells of salvation is open to the whole world to accept Jesus Christ as our Lord and Saviour. And the devil, who has been defeated on the cross, has not got the power to close those wells of salvation. All you have to do as a Christian is, number one, believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God who opened up salvation to all mankind which you have done. And if you are a Christian, all you have to do now is with joy draw from the wells of salvation that are where? On the inside of you. And last but not least, how do you draw from the wells of salvation? How do you actually draw? Do you remember the woman at the well and Jesus said to the woman at the well, you know, he asked her for water. And of course she said, I have, I have nothing to draw with, there's nothing to draw. So how do we draw with, from the wells of salvation? The first thing is, you confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord. And if you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you are saved. So the moment that you confessed that Jesus Christ is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you are saved. That's the first time we draw from the wells of salvation. The second way we can draw from the wells of salvation is with praise and thanksgiving. When we praise and worship Jesus as we did this morning and as Sandra led us into worship, what were we doing? We were praising God, but we were drawn from the wells of salvation that is within us. Another way to draw from the wells of salvation is when we pray. When you go to prayer meetings here, when you pray at home, what you are doing is you're praying, you're drawn from those wells. In fact, Romans tells us that if we don't know how to pray, we can groan inwardly in the spirit. What are we doing? We are drawn from the wells of salvation. When we witness to other people that Jesus Christ is Lord, what are we doing? We are drawing from the wells of salvation. Remember the woman at the well. What did the woman of the well do when she met Jesus? She went back into her village and she said to everyone in the village, I met a man today who knew everything about my life. I met Jesus. She was drawn from the wells of salvation. <clears throat> when we cry out and shout, 
You know, we Christians have something to shout about, haven't we? We have a lot to shout about when we cry and praise to God. Jesus said himself in John 7, on the Feast of Tabernacles, if anyone is thirsty, let him come unto me and drink. And out of his innermost being will flow rivers of living water. Without the living water of salvation, people will turn to drugs, drink, gambling, smoking, or something to satisfy their thirst. Without that well of salvation, that well of salvation is in, on the inside of you. Don't let the devil cover over your well. But allow you to draw from that well. And Jesus said to the woman at the well, whoever drinks of the water that I give will never thirst again. That wells of salvation is already on the inside of you. So let's be joyful today. Even though we are surrounded by enemies on every side, we can be joyful within. Because the victory is won. Jesus has conquered sin and death. He's conquered the grave. Your well is open. It cannot be covered over. All you have to do is like Hezekiah, just sneak out and drink with joy and enjoy your salvation. And if there's anyone that you don't, people out here that you don't know who are saved, you need to tell them that God's coming judgment is about to fall on this world. And whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. And that well will be opened up on the inside of you. Amen. Amen. Do we close in a song? Yeah. Yes, we do. Amen. <clears throat>